Hey everyone, this is a hardware news roundup for the past week of hardware launches, including some new stuff today, kind of from E3, and then a lot of stuff from Computex, some that we didn't get a chance to see at the show. Items of note include Logitech's new wireless charging mouse and mouse pad, which is basically a, it's a magnetic resonance charger. The CryoRig CPU coolers are also on our list. We're talking about some of the other cooling solutions at Computex, AlphaCool, FSP, and so on, and then PCIe 5.0 in the industry section of the news roundup. Before that, this content is brought to you by custom backplate makers at v1tech.com. V1 Tech builds GPU backplates to order with their online customization tool, making it easy to theme upcoming PC builds. Backplates cost $25 and up and are installed via magnet and can be seen in some shots of the cards we're reviewing lately. Use code GAMERSNEXUS5 for $5 off your order or click the link below. Starting with Logitech's announcement at E3 today, the company is putting out a new series of products. There's the G703 mouse and G903 mouse. Both of these mice have the same weight cartridge or container in the bottom of the mouse, but it's actually functional now. It's not just a 10 gram weight or whatever it may be. The weight cartridge now can contain a unit that I think they're calling a power core or power module, and that is used to make contact with uh, basically a second mouse pad. So there's a power play pad, they call it, which is a charging station for the mouse, and that sits underneath the mouse mat, the normal mat. It's about two millimeters thick, so it's not too much taller than normally, and uh, that is able to provide enough current to the mouse just via USB 2.0, in order to power both the receiver, the wireless receiver, and power the charging to uh, a level that you could charge and slightly trickle charge the mouse while using it, or if you wanted to, you could plug it in for a faster charge. We'll have a lot more detail on this in the article below, but the basics of it are just two new mice. The G903 is the G900, but now compatible with this power play setup. The mat is about 100 bucks, so if you wanted to add the wireless charging support, it would be $100 more. Uh, it is not the most efficient way to charge a product. It, this never has been. Inductive charging is a bit more efficient, but also not nearly as efficient as plugging something in. But it's a way to remove the mouse from the cable to the mouse. So if you want to do that, this is really the only way to achieve that without ever having to plug it in between use or something like that. We'll look at this in more depth and review it properly, but uh, for now it's USB 2.0, so it can deliver 500 milliamps at five volts. We don't know how much current is actually transferred to the device during use. We'll talk to them more about that. Uh, it, the base, underlying base creates a, an EM field that charges the mouse uh, from a radius out of the center of the pad, the power play mat, and towards the edges it'll be weaker, but hopefully you're not ever towards the edges anyway. Works via magnetic resonance, not the same as Corsair's new wirelessly charged mouse that you may have seen at Computex, which I believe uses the Qi charging setup. Uh, so it's a bit different than that. This power play mat, because of the way it's designed, means it won't work if you have a metal table or other large metal objects like a metal mouse pad on top of it, uh, but it will work with normal mouse pads of some kind of fabric. So again, more information on that in the article below, but moving on now to CryoRig. On top of launching the new Taku case currently on Kickstarter, CryoRig has a new series of CPU coolers. So they have an update to the CPU tower series that would include the CryoRig C7 and the R5. And the new coolers, some of them will have variants that include copper for the fin stack rather than aluminum. This is interesting for a few reasons. Now, one thing, copper is heavier, it's more expensive, so that'll be reflected in the price and in support for how large the cooler can be before it starts posing a problem for the socket spec for mounting force and weight. Uh, but it also has a lot greater thermal conductivity, although because of the way copper works with its specific heat capacity versus aluminum, you end up with a situation where thermal conductivity is far greater, but it also will take longer to uh, heat up and cool down. So this is, interesting because it makes it act sort of like a liquid cooling radiator where you see those longer soak times where the cooling device takes longer to uh, to soak the temperature so like with a liquid cooler you end up with a more even fan curve over time the fan ramping speed should be a little bit slower hard to say just how much without actually testing it we have asked them for both aluminum and copper units to test that uh, so fan ramp will be a bit slower 
And other than that, once you're at steady state, the difference probably won't be huge, maybe a couple degrees, but we'll look into all that hopefully if we can get one of each cooler. Uh, and that will be coming out, the C7 comes out first, and then the R5 will come out later this year. And uh, other than that, it's, it's cryo rig coolers as normal. Also at Computex, FSP demonstrated a new liquid cooled power supply, which is an interesting mixture of things to have in a power supply. $700 price for this one. It looks like it should be called the FSP Hydro PTM Plus, 80 plus platinum, RGB LEDs, of course, uh, and again, liquid cooled. Now, a few things about this. Liquid cooling a power supply for our type of system builds, enthusiast audience, isn't really necessary. You can passively cool a lot of power supplies if you have the money to pay for it these days. Uh, and you still need to have a fan active anyway. So liquid cooling a power supply is, is very much a bling factor type of thing. There may be some functional adds to it that are not covered in our use cases or for our audience, but for our audience, this is, it's just so you could say you have a liquid cooled power supply. That's probably the start and the end of it. Uh, so something to look out for. Personally speaking, I don't know that I want a liquid cooled power supply in my system. Liquid cooling in general is fairly safe. And if there is some sort of leak, maybe it goes into the back of the video card and you kill a video card worst case scenario, but certainly not, uh, not a power supply. So I'm, I'm very interested to hear more from FSP about how the power supply works, how they've insulated things for safety. It, you would think it has to be done uh, and how, uh, how the liquid actually impacts performance for a longer uptime at a higher load. But we'll look into all that more as with all this other stuff from Computex. Time to do the rest of this year. AlphaCool is the next in cooling news. So they have new CPU and GPU blocks that were shown at Computex as well. And they also have new Helix reservoirs, they're called. In addition to the water blocks, the Helix reservoirs and uh, the RGB illumination that they had at the show, AlphaCool also has a new 420 millimeter Ice Bear AIO cooler or CLC if you prefer and their Aurora HT lighting accessory, which is used for illuminated tubing and coolant. And then they've also got a custom cable modding kit. So they're branching out a bit this year. The company's new water blocks, by the way, will be using nylon. So that's a bit different. AlphaCool notes this as being more resistant to cracking and warping over time. Also in accessories news, Sapphire has new add-ons for their Nitro series of video cards, primarily colorized backplates and shrouds. So you can add some color to the existing Nitro video card lineup. And they also showed off mini ITX cards and an external GPU adapter, which seems to be increasingly popular. Last year, we saw a lot of them and that trend has died off a bit this year, but it's still continuing for external GPUs. Moving on to industry topics now, SK Hynix's 72 layer NAND is on track to ship this year and the memory maker has made it known that they are currently working on new NAND with 96 and 128 layers respectively. This will allow for 512 gigabit and one terabit die capacity. And for one terabit, that's actually 128 gigabytes on a single die, which is really dense data storage. Micron and Toshiba are working on 64 layer 3D NAND now as well, though that should ship a bit sooner than the multi-year project that SK Hynix is currently developing. Then one of the more interesting news topics for this week, although we don't have a ton of data on it right now, the PCI SIG board is working on developing its spec for PCIe 5.0, 4.0 of course not being out yet. 4.0 looks like it's supposed to start being used at some level anyway in 2018 and 5.0 should have the spec finalized and released to manufacturers in 2019. That does not mean they'll start using it in 2019, just means they're gonna have it. Just like the PCIe 4.0 spec's been available for a little while now, but isn't actually on boards yet for uh, for any of our markets. So uh, PCIe 5, it looks like it should offer over 32 giga transfers per second for a single lane. And to put that into perspective, that's the speed we get today for PCIe 3.0 by four. So four lanes of 3.0 gets you the same as a single lane of 5.0 at 32 giga transfers per second. Uh, with PCIe 4.0 being in between the two and shipping sooner, probably next year for some of its initial appearances. And as we move towards more big data applications, it looks like PCIe might be getting a bit of a fast track as the interface needs to develop to keep pace with other 
products, video cards and add-in cards and accelerators and all that stuff. So keep an eye on the PCI SIG board going forward. But for now, PCIe 5.0 is the item to talk about. And then looking at Intel's lineup, Cannon Lake and Ice Lake have a bit more information out. Intel is pushing ever onward with their seemingly accursed 10 nanometer production. However, in a recent celebratory tweet by Intel, the company touted reaching a milestone with 10 nanometers. Cannon Lake is on track for shipping in the second half of 2017. And Ice Lake is taped out or in the final stages of design development and so forth before hitting the fab. Intel's fourth 14 nanometer chip, Coffee Lake, is still expected to ship this year as well. So they're gonna have a busy final half of the year. And speaking of Intel, the company's products were used to set new overclocking world records last week at Computex with the i7-7740K and X299 platform. MSI, Gigabyte, and G-Skill were all touting overclocking records this past week achieved on that platform. And Gigabyte and their teams of overclockers burned through $20,000 of liquid helium to hit a 7.5 gigahertz clock on the new i7 CPU, while LN2 was used to push a presumably new memory kit from G-Skill to 5.5 gigahertz or 5,500 megahertz DDR4. We covered both of these feats in a bit more depth over on the website if you want to check those articles out. And just for some perspective on that cost, we were speaking with Der Bauer at the G-Skill booth when we did that deleting video with him. And I asked, how much does it cost you when you start using liquid helium? And where he is, his region of the world, it's about $4.4 per second that it's open, just to put that $20,000 number into, into perspective. So definitely a lot more expensive than LN2, where you might pay something like a dollar, maybe $2 per liter. Big difference there. Uh, finally, there were some displays. There's a whole lot of miscellaneous news for this past week. But for display news, we tend to include a bit of this towards the end. Samsung's got a new QLED and HDR gaming monitor lineup, including some that are in the 40 plus inch range, if that's something you're interested in. Uh, of these, they announced VA panels that are HDR enabled. The screens are curved, that's a thing now. And uh, they feature the same 1800R curvature you see everywhere else. So curved screens are kind of like tempered glass at this point, where you've seen it everywhere. But Depending on how big the monitor is, it can actually be useful, speaking from experience. The monitors are looking at 144 hertz refresh rates on some of them. FreeSync 2 will be supported, so that was announced at CES and is finally getting implementation. And prices range from $600 to $1,500. ASUS has new ROG Swift PG27UQ monitors coming out as well. And these will also be uh, HDR displays, quantum dot enabled and will be a 4K 27 inch IPS panel, also with a refresh rate of 144 Hertz. So uh, that pretty much covers us for the last week of news. Plenty of smaller stuff at the show uh, and stuff that we just didn't get to. For example, NRMAX Max Titan power supplies, if power supplies interest you. Uh, Guile has an NVMe SSD. EK Waterblocks has an MSI X370X power titanium monoblock coming out. And then there's also the Apple iMac Pro, I guess. So that covers everything. As always, you can, you can subscribe for more information and go to patreon.com slash gamersnext to help us out directly. Thanks for watching. I'll see you all next time. However, in a recent celebratory... However, in a recent celebra celeb however, in a recent celebra celebratory, that's hard to say fast, man. <laughs>